Some people have already said this prayer last night in Arabic, some have said it this morning in Shahrid, some may not say it at all, some may change the text radically. The question is, why Nahem? What's it about? Where did it come from? And what metamorphosis has it gone through over the centuries? That's what we're looking at. Uh, so if you want to help out my son Eli over there, he has some books, you can open up Nahem. <laughs> So page 234 in the, in the Tisha book, and what page in this book? 126. 126 in the Bulyah book. So if you notice, since Michael opened up uh, the Sidur, and he told us page 126, you will not find any other reference to Tisha in the Bulyah book Sidur, or in most Sidur for that matter, except for Nahem. What is it about Nahem that it's the only thing that has made it into the prayer book? We have this whole separate book of Kinot and Ifan, what have you, but the only prayer that comes to play is Nahem. It's the only thing that we find in our Sidur. We're not finding anything else. Is it the only important thing? Is it the only thing people know about? Is it the only idea that has to do with Tisha B'Av? That's what I want to try to examine. Maybe we'll come up with an answer. Maybe we won't. As we know, our halakhot generally come from the Talmud Babli. The Babylonian Talmud is the source for our halakhot as a general rule. We know that we have our Rishonim. They look at the Talmud. And from the Talmud, they extract the halakhot. Mainly, we're talking about the Reef, the Rosh, the Rambam. Of course, all the other Rishonim. But the main ones that, you know, that we as Sefaradim have looked to, at least to start with, are the Arif. Arif is the first one who systematically went through the Gemara extracting the Halakhot that we see. When we come to Tisha Ab and the Arif, he does something that's very, very out of character for him. He does not quote the Talmud Babli. He brings us the Halakha, and he quotes it from the Talmud Yerushalmi. The Talmud Yerushalmi was the Talmud that was written or put together in Yerushalayim, in Eretz Yisrael, in Palestine at the time, 4th to 5th century. And generally we don't extract halakot from it. There are ideas, there are parallel ideas to the Talmud Babli. There are a lot of agadot, there are a lot of stories, there are a lot of you know happenings. And we look at it as just a as a crutch to use together with the Talmud Babli as a general rule. But we don't really follow the Halakhot from it for whatever reason. One of the main reasons seems to be that the Talmud Babli came later. And so we say this is the Talmud Aharon, and since that's what went, that was the final law, and then the Saboraim and the Geonim were in Babel, so we follow that track. For some reason, again, the Leaf is quoting the Talmud Yerushalmi. So what happens? There is a statement in the Talmud Yerushalmi. I'm going to have a few sheets over here, so maybe I'll give those out. So, 
give the Talmud Yerushalmi pretty soon, but there's a statement in Talmud, and it appears in Masechet Berachot, and once again in Masechet Ta'amiyot of the Talmud Yerushalmi. And what happens in this Talmud, it starts like this, the beginning, and I don't want to start until you have it, but basically, this is going to be the source where we first see about Nahem. But at the same time, we don't see Nahem. And that's what's confusing about it. And what develops over Halakha and in our liturgy. And what the Hafamim may be trying to tell us. So Tamun Yerushalmi starts. Amar bi ahabar yashhaq b'shem bi hayyad sipurim. The top of the page. Yahid bi tish'a b'ab sarikh lehaskir mi'ayn ha mi'ura. An individual on Tisha B'Av has to mention the happening of the day. Ma'hu Umir. Now it's talking about the Yahid. Of course, the Sibur is saying it as well, but the individual is saying it in his private Amidah. What does he have to say? Rahim Allah Yeluhim Birahamiqa Rabbim Ubahasadiqa Hadi Amanim Ayyu Ba'al Amikai Sahib Ba'ayu Shanki Lefa Ba'al Siyam Shanki Wada the wording, for the most part, if you looked at Yisidurim, if you looked at Nahayim over there, pretty much similar. Obviously, you see the first stark difference is Tamur Yerushalmi starting with Rahim, and now Yisidurim saying Nahayim. Is there a difference? Is it a typo, maybe? Did somebody change it on purpose? The Gemara, again, said you have to mention the happening of the day in your Amida. Before we explain that, let's continue a little bit further and see how the Gemara continues. Rebi Abdima the Sipurim. Ga'ekume Rebimana. Efanumla. So Rebi Abdima went to Rebimana and he said, Where do I say it? Where do I say this prayer in the Amida? Where do I insert it? Amarle. Ga'adain. In a Tadizu. But you still don't know. Hold the law, Shehu, Laba, or Labo, depending on how you want to read it, Umra, Bahabuda. Behold the law, Shehu, the Sha'abar, Umra, Behuda, Uma Ita, Amra, Fair, Menotin, Huda, the Sha'abar, the Sorek, like the law. So, Bimana answers B. Abdima, and he tells him, Don't you know the general rule that we have? Anything that we're praying for the future, we say in the Abuda. The Abuda section is the Rese section of the Abida. We would usually say Ya'adi Biyabu for Rosh Hodesh or for Hanab Mu'ayyid or Yom Tov or whatever the big case may be. And anything the Sha'abar, anything that you're referring to the past, you say in Huda, Huda being in Mudim. We say Al Hanisim for Hanukkah or for Purim. This is the rule that the Gemara is giving, and this is what he's telling him to say. So you have now a prayer that starts differently than the prayer that we currently say. It does not appear in the Berakha Bunei Yerushalayim like we currently say. Text is, di text is different, but the, I, the concepts are more or less the same. More elaborate. Yeah, much more elaborate. Yeah. Yes, David? Uh, maybe I missed this. Why do we say this in the Quran, not Shahari? We didn't get to that yet. That's going to be later on, I hope. <laughs> if we get that far. So, touching upon David's question, if you look at this, He's telling you, you have to say this prayer as part of the Amidah. Is he telling you Munha? No. He's telling you Ambit? He's telling you Shahrit? He's telling you Me'ah Me'ura. But Me'ah Me'ura refers to the happening of the day. So if we're comparing it to, whether we're comparing it to Ya'adib Ya'abu or to al Hanisim, we know that those we say in all prayers of the day, in Ambit, in Shahrit, in Munha, it's said continuously. So again, what's going on over here? Why only Nuha? Why the change from Rahim to Nahim? Why the placement in the Amidah differently than we have it today? Anybody care to venture an answer? 
So now, yeah, you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you want to correspond to Nahamu, that afterwards, Nahtara. But this all came later on. Oh. All that came into our prayer later on. That didn't yeah. exist. Because here, we just read from the Talmud Yerushalmi what it was taught, telling us about any sort of change or addition to the prayer on Shabbat. It didn't give us anything else. I didn't cut out a piece of the Gemara and say, I'm only telling, showing you this piece. There's nothing else in Talmud Yerushalmi talking about what we say or what we pray on Shabbat. What's the Talmud on me? I'm going to get to that right now. You don't have that in front of you, but hopefully I have a copy of it over here. Where is the placement of the Tefillah in accordance to this? And, and you're saying it during it's the same place where you would say uh, yeah, that boy, you would be saying this. Let me find a copy of the Talmud Babli. Talmud Babli, though. Uh, hmm? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but it would be, what? But it'd be interesting to see <laughs> if the Ashkenazim have, if it's different for them also, because then that would suggest that the change came around part of like. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you, we're going to touch on the Gionim, we're going to get to everybody. All right? Well, give me a second. <laughs> hmm? No, it's all right. Don't worry about the social film. So look at Talmud Babli now. If you don't have that in front of you, I'm sorry. I didn't have a chance to make a copy of it. Talmud Babli, Masekha Ta'anit. Home is what in Nuhagot Ba'abir, Nuhagot Ba'abir. But we're starting off from a whole different mindset. The Tamul Yerushalmi is not telling you about Abirud whatsoever. It's talking about Rahamim. We're asking for the Ulam to have mercy upon us. Tamul Babli is coming from a different angle, comparing Shabi'ab to a mourner, to Abirud. And he tells you, Asur, Ba'akhila, Ushtiya, 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 Sandat, Sandat, Ushtiya, 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 All the things that we know that were Asur to do all day, that's what we find in the Tamul Babli. And like we said earlier in the class, we know we get our halakhot generally from the Talmud Dabli. So all this makes sense, that we don't do anything, we don't eat, we don't drink, we don't anoint, we don't wear leather shoes, we don't have sexual relations, we don't read Torah, everything, you know, as you know, as we do it today. The Gemara continues, and it's one more thing. Okay. If it's a custom to work on Shabbat, you could work. If the custom is not to work, you don't work. Based upon Manhattan. Okay. And in any place, the hafarim don't work. Unfortunately, we see that too often today. But the bunch of women over there says everybody should make himself like a David Hatham and not work. Continues though. Rabban Shimon ben ben Gamliel Omer, Kol ha'ochir b'shotev shabbat ilu ochir b'shotev yom purim. Very clear. We know that. Biachiva Omer, Kol ha'ochir b'dachar shabbat inu lo esim am b'dachar de'olam. Fine. Hatamim Omer, Kol ha'ochir b'dachar shabbat inu metabir al yushalayim. Again, you're coming back to home to force that point of abirut. And that is all the Gemara says about Tisha'abah. It gives you the laws of comparing it to Abidut. It gives you the laws about not working. It gives you laws about mourning for Yerushalayim, but no prayer. No prayer whatsoever. In other words, pray the way you always do, do whatever you want. Yamara is not giving you anything to say. So we have two different ways of looking at Yom Tisha two different focuses. One focus of Rahamim and praying for the future, and the other focus from the Babli of being mournful and crying over Yerushalayim. Now you would think the Talmud Yerushalmi, written in Israel, they would be warning over Yerushalayim more. But they're the ones that are looking for hope. They're looking for rebuilding. They're looking towards the future. And they said they're giving you two different messages over here. One is a message of hope. We know it was destroyed, but we know Bode Alam has promised to rebuild. So it's coming back. And we have to pray for that. We have to ask God to have mercy upon us and to do that. 
Whereas those that are in Galut, in Babel, they just sit there crying and do nothing about it. Keep those thoughts in mind. So now we come back to the tefillah. What do we do with this tefillah of Rahim? Is it Rahim or not Rahim? Now instead of reading through 15, 16, 17 sources to show you it'll take too much time and we're not going to accomplish much. I'm going to try to run through a few of them and we may look at a few specific ones. So the first thing we look at again is the reef. The reef says Rahim. And it's fine. But all modern printings, if you open up, go buy a leaf today and open it, what does it say? It says Nahem. Okay, the printers have played with it. Why? Because it fits their agenda. It goes hand in hand with what their Sidurim. They don't want to change the Sidur. So it works for them. And the Rosh realizes this mistake and understands it's Rahem, but he wants to know why we're not saying it. And he goes one step further, the Rosh, but now you have to understand, the Rosh was originally from Germany, from Ashkenaz, and he moved to northern Spain, to Toledo. And he brought a lot of Ashkenazi customs with him from Germany into Spain. And he's telling you, listen, I don't understand what's going on. The Talmud Yerushalmi is pretty clear that it would make sense to say that all the Tefillot, but why? I don't say it in all the Tefillot, he's telling you. Because I grew up only saying it in Manhattan. I'm only saying Manhattan. Why is that? And he left it as an open question. He didn't know the answer. Later on, when Maran and Yosef Karo wrote the Beit Yosef, he wrote a commentary on the tour, the tour written by the Rosh's son. And he said, I'm going to answer your father's question. And I'm going to tell you because the fires of the Beit HaMikdash, specifically in the Hechal, didn't really start to, to burn strongly until the Menha time, and that's that's when you're looking for Nehamana. Now you want this consolation. It's until that point, whether it's the night time, let's say last night or this morning, and you see he got, got this idea not just on his own, he picked it up from others like Sefer HaManhir and the Ritba, they all brought the same idea that the nighttime in the morning as, as if you have a your corpse in front of you. You have you know, you have a dead body in front of you, whether whoever it may be, and now you're in the state of Aniyut. Aniyut is a state that you are pre-morning, before Abirut. And only once the real burning started happening in the Hechal, you move into a state of Abirut, and once you have this Abirut, now you want this Nehama. Until then, you don't need Nehama because you're at a different stage of the game. You're not ready to accept consolation. You're still looking, you know, at you know, at the corpse of your beloved in front of you. You can't have anybody walk up to you, oh, I'm so sorry, well, I'm so sorry. I, I gotta bury this, I have to deal with it, but I don't know what to do with myself at this point. So you're saying you're bereaved at that point, you can't handle it. So this is the way the Big Yosef wants to handle it. Looking at that, you would think the Big Yosef now agrees that it should only be said during Manhattan, for Arbit Shahri and Manhattan. Once again, completely confusing. Um, who wrote up? Albert brought up about the, the Gewonim. Okay, so now we have the Gewonim. Our earliest Gaon that deals with the Tefillot is Amram Gaon. Amram Gaon lived he passed around 845, if I'm not mistaken. And he deals with the Rahim prayer. He basically quotes the Yerushalmi verbatim and tells you to say it in all three to be Lord and gives you the exact wording from the Yerushalmi with Rahim. And, but he doesn't tell you where to say it in the Amidah yet. So you have the Rahim prayer. He's not telling you where to say it what to do with it. I mean, he's telling you there's a prayer to say. Short while later, only 50 years later, Ben Sa'ad Yagyaun comes along and says, there are those people that add this Berakha in the Berakha of Bunei Rushalayim. And if you want to add it, fine, say it. If you don't want to say it, that's also fine. You don't have to say it. Other versions of 
Sa'adat al Sidur that arrived in Spain seem to have different versions. I will tell you a corrupt version. They tell you that those who say it during the Ha'am. I'm telling you it's a corrupt version because through the Geniza discoveries, we've discovered more authenticated uh, texts of Sa'adat al We know what his handwriting looked like, and we know what he actually said and what he didn't say. So if you open up the Abu Dirham, who tells you that Sa'adat al said only to say it Ha, and so that's what we do. And that had the custom developed in Spain, even of only saying this Nahim during Maha, it was based on a corrupt version of Sa'adi Gaon. But according to the Rushami, it's all three to Philot, according to the Amram Gaon, all three to Philot, and according to a correct version of Sa'adi Gaon, you don't have to say it at all. But if you want to, you can say it. If you don't want to, you don't have to say it. He doesn't tell you what to say it, but he's telling you now to say it during this Barakha of Bune Rushami. So, I think at this point we're more confused than we were before. No, honestly, I'm, I'm talking in all honesty. Should we say this prayer? Are we saying a correct prayer? What wording should we be using? You know, where did it come from? How did it originate? How did it evolve? Where does it stand today? We have no answers. That's the bottom line. That's the truth of it. So, Rahim prayer. Why did the Hachamim choose this wording of Rahim? And how does it work in with is it really Rahim? Are we looking for Rahmanut from Bore Olam? Does it make sense what I said before? We're just asking God, we know that the third building is coming, we know you're going to return you know, us to our promised land, and just do it for us, have mercy upon us, kick everybody else out, and let's just do things the right way. Is that what it's all about? Is that a concept that existed in our prayers before, or is it something that they just created then and there. And here's the interesting thing now. We talked about the Giniza. The Giniza, as we know, brings a lot of documentation of what was going on. And we think, we pick up our Sidur, yeah, so everybody prays. That's what we've always prayed, right? David? Wrong, probably not. Definitely not. Definitely not. Definitely not. Our tefillah has gone through so many changes. It's still changing. Yes, it's still changing. Most of the time for the worse, but it's still changing. People are adding things, people are deleting things. Uh, it's going through changes. And the tefillah of Eres Yisrael and the tefillah of Babel were two very, very different tefillot. In other words, if you were a businessman in Babylonia, you took a trip to Yerushalayim, you would not be able to follow the prayer for the most part. The tefillot were completely different a thousand years ago. You couldn't compare them. So this beracha that we would say in our prayer la'amida, tishkom edo kirush amirchad, that's the way the beracha starts, where we're inserting this nahem, okay? Or as the Ashkenazim say today, v'lirushalayim amirchad, that's the way they begin the beracha. Correct, Jack? Yes. Um, how did they start it in Israel? That Berakha in Israel a thousand years ago started with Rahim. Rahim al Yerushalayim. The same beginning, the same type of Rahim that we're looking at in the Talmud Yerushalmi is the way it started. I have it on my phone. I was able to find the Sigur Israel online. I'll read to you exactly how it appeared. It's an insertion. It was yeah, wait, a, no, it's it was an insertion. A change in syntax? No. It's. The Berachat was staying as is, and then you were inserting this later on. Because if you notice the Berachat, the, the, this text in the Yerushalmi has no Berachat attached to it. So here's the Berachat. What that, part was the insertion? What was it? Did I say it? No, no. What was it? It starts. The name of the Berachat was. There's no Berachat. Watch. The name of the piece was Rahim. Right? right. And that right. is inserted the same place where you would insert the Ali Abu when you make, when you do the Amidah on your shoulders. Okay? So in the Sidur of Eris Israel, we're talking about a thousand years ago, eight hundred years ago even, the Berakha went like this. Rahim Allah Eloheinu Berachamecha Rabbim Al Yisrael Amecha Va'al Yerushalayim Irecha Va'al Siyom Shantu Wadecha Va'al Hecharecha Va'al Ne'onecha Va'al Nakhub Be'al David Mashiach Sidkecha Baruch Atta Amunai Elohe David Buni Yerushalayim that was the Berakhah that they said in the Amidah three times a day, throughout the year. 
Even on the flip side from Israel, the, they didn't have the Gawim over there, but they had the Rabbanim of Israel, Bil Azar HaKalir, who most of the Ashkenazim get their Piyutim and their Piyot from, he also wrote Sidi Hod and Tahanunim for Tisha Abiyad. So, again, what's going on over here? If we're saying Sidi Hod and Tahanunim a thousand years ago, how they cut out, and what does it have to do with this change of Rahim and Nahim? It seems that people fell into a major depression. And it seems that the depression happened with the Ashkenazi, mainly due to the Crusades. The Crusades started around 1095, right? Hmm? 1090. 1090, okay, I was not far off. Okay, so the Crusades started, and what happened now is that the Shahada took a whole, took upon itself a whole different meaning for Ashkenazi. Not for Safari, because for Safari it didn't change, it didn't affect anything. But basically those Crusades came in and decimated, decimated communities, cities, towns, villages. Everybody was gone. They were just mastering left and right. At this point, what are the people going to say? Is this a continuation of Tisha B'Av? Is Borei Olam out to get us? Is he out to destroy us? We need what? We need Nehava. That's where the concept of Nehava seems to have come in, because we don't see it until the Ashkenazim changed it. And it changed first where? By Rashi. Rashi is the first one to change it. He was living at that time. And his students, uh, and you see it in Mahzor Vitni, who was his main student. And that's where you first start seeing the change from Rahim to Nahim. Now they're looking for Nehama. They change the text of the prayer. There are a lot of subtle differences, but there are many differences. And they're the ones who insert it into it seems that they're the ones who really force, you know, its issue over there. And because they can't deal with the Abirut issue anymore, They've, they're they sick and tired of it, because all they're seeing is massacre around them. They're the ones who first took out the Sayyidah and Tahanwim. Through them, by way of Germany and France, things moved into Spain. And from Spain, things began to affect all the other Seferadim, once the Jews from Spain were expelled in 1492 and moved out to the entire Ottoman Empire, to the Levant, and everything started changing from there. So our entire prayer, the way it was known to our Gilunim, okay, again, talking about a thousand years ago, it seems like a long time ago, but it's not, but I'm showing you the development and the change in our prayer and how the events in one part of the world affected the entire Jewish world. So now we're dealing again with Nahim. But where did they get Nahim from? Where did this concept of Nahim come from? Why change it from Rahim to Nahim? Nahamu, so what? But why change it? Why change it? Where are where did they get the idea from? You had to still have those Sidurim on your head, right? Good. 
company school, but to a section that you wouldn't think you're going to see. Open up page 529. 529 in Kholi Aqob. There's no 529 in the other book, right? 529. Berkat ham mazon for abilim. Yes, we say berkat ham mazon we eat, but when you're sitting, this is different berkat ham mazon to say. And those sitting, those sitting to eat with the abilim, have to say this berkat ham mazon with them. And look at the language. Who wants to read it out for us? Michael, you want to read it for us? <coughs> Go ahead. Enough. Enough. How does it start? <laughs> Nahem. And how does the one in the Amidah start now? <laughs> no, now. No, now. No, Nahem. What? what? Nahem what? So basically they copied the Amidah from the So basically they copied what they were saying. They were just in a constant state of mourning for a hundred plus years. And they took this state of mourning and they transposed it. From the Berkat al that they were saying practically every day, because they were in Abirut for close to 100 years, if not more, and they picked it up and just threw it into the Siddur of Shabbat. Our entire Talmud Baghdi that gave us the idea of Rahamim, the idea of Rahamim that Harambam tries to drive home to us, okay, and if you look at Harambam's wording, Harambam changed the wording of the Gushalmi, I'll, I'll read it to you you'll see that he had this idea of hope, you know, of what our day is going to take care of things for us. And the Ashkenazim went and completely wiped it out. We have no more hope anymore. It's all about, I'm a, I'm a poor dip. I have nothing to look forward to. I, I have nothing left in my life. What our just console me. Just console me. Make me feel good. It's a different attitude. Well, we always have the attitude that we have to do. And we still have that attitude that we have to do. Things don't just come to us. You have to get up and work for them. You have to work hard for them. You have to achieve. And even for Beit HaMikdash, we have to achieve. And we have to know that Bani has Rahim on us, but we have to work with that Rahim. It's not about sitting back and collecting Sadaqah. It's a very, very different attitude that you see in the prayer and in the attitude of the way the Ashkenazim approach it to the way we as Sefaradim, or when you want to talk about the Geonim of Babel, or when you talk to the Hachamim of Eres Israel, the entire region, even though they were at odds in the way they looked at it, it's completely different. It's a foreign way of looking at things than we look at things today. And unfortunately, we know how things are looked at today, and those ideas keep coming in to try to destroy us. Okay? And we can't let them destroy us. But now we have, Baruch Hashem, we have Israel back in our hands for the most part. And another question that comes up is, do we change the Nahem prayer? Does it fit or it doesn't fit? That's the question. Today it doesn't fit. So you want to say that you want to change it. Should we change it like certain rabbis have proposed to change? And Maybe this uh, Sidur may have ha has a change in it or not. At one point, they did have a change. They took out the change? All right, they took out the change. It's two words. Um, but we could change. Should we go back to the Nosach of the Yerushalmi? Should we go back and use what Haram Bam has to say? There are different ideas. But the question is, when somebody comes up with an idea, OK, we're going to change Nahem, Everybody gets all up and on. <gasps> How could you change haram? You can't change anything in the Siddur. We just showed it was changed. It was changed and changed again and changed again and changed again. Even the Pirafah that we say right now in the in this uh, Rahim edition, right now we say uh Rahim Sion Bibinyani Okay, that's the current version in the books that are in front of you. Whether you're looking at Paul Yaakov, we're looking at the Siddur Chabab, or we're looking at almost every book coming out of Israel today for Sefaradim, it says Baruch Atta Amunai, Menachem, Siyon, Bibinyan, Yerushalayim. Until about 60 years ago, didn't say that. 
مثل منحم شیون او بونه یرو شدائی هرم بان اونی سه او بونه یرو شدائی دیگه سه منحم شیون رو So not only has the text undergone change, but the actual berakhah, the harima of the berakhah, the people tell you can't change a berakhah, that's changed. So there's definitely room to change it. It probably needs to be changed. You could have, you know, we could stand here for hours. What words should be changed or not be changed? Why should we change it? Is it politically correct to change it? What ideas are we conveying by changing it? I'm not really sure about that. That's something that's, that would be a completely different type of class, and we have to actually have those texts in front of us to compare and contrast what's correct or incorrect. But I think a lot has to be said about what's going on with our sibur, what's going on with the ideas and concepts that are within our prayers, and where the ideas have come from, and where they're going. I hope that uh, helps somewhat. Yes, David. I'm sorry, just to backtrack. No, no, don't be backtrack. I don't have much more to say. I don't, I, 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 I don't remember the... Where, where you made this point. Tell me. The fact that it's in Minha, yes. as opposed to all of the Tibilot, right. is because Minha particularly is when... Because Minha is... The, 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 the sources say, or... Right. Well, we'll quote the bit you'll say for now, okay, even though, like I said, the Ridba says it, and Sefer HaManik say it, that the Ait Arib, yeah. that's when Ish Sari Fat Right, okay. okay. So, so, so that's one theme. Right? That's the theme, yes. The, 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 the most... Um, the most pointy. drastic destruction right. happened is right now. at the Manhattan, right. At now, instead, you've taken that, and now it's a period of... We don't sit on the floor during this period right. of time. We sit up, we're, we're, we're asking now... Right, because hold. now now we're already buried. We finished burying. Now we're go, now we're at the end. In other words, until this point we were on Right. Okay, mm -hmm. it started burning, saw the structure. Okay, let's bury it, let's get out into, into the <coughs> mindset of Abirut. Now we've hit that point of Abirut. Now we're home, we're sitting, you know, we already finished with that Habra, and people are coming to visit us and to console us, and you know, and that's where we are right now. And this is now continuing, this mindset now continues for where are we at? 1,947 years now. Okay, it's time to get rid of this, hopefully, and you know, move forward so we don't have to have to try that ever again. That's really our hope, obviously, and this is what we want. Borei Alam to have the Rahayim on us, now where it comes to the Rahayim comes in. We want Borei Alam's mercy, because without Borei Alam's mercy, nothing happens. Is the, yeah. is the lack of Tahamim on uh, the Shabbat, um, does it correlate to the Bet Eber, but there's no Tahamim Bet Eber? Does it correlate to it? We look at what the Talmud Bethi says compares the, you know, the Isumim, but it doesn't compare anything about the Filo. So, you're just guessing if you say yes. You're right. I'm just guessing if I say yes. Right. Doesn't, you know, I mentioned somewhere that, uh, that, 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 yeah. Right, so, Qara'a alayh mu'ayt. But what is a mu'ayt? That's the whole thing. In which pasuk? You first of all, it doesn't seem that the Qara'a alayh mu'ayt seems to be the pasuk. There's another uh, reference to mu'ayt in Ikha. And even with that, it doesn't seem to prove, because, okay, you want to say, or we put the other pesukim. How come we said the Geonim were writing Tahanunim and Kinot, not Kinot, uh, and Sirihot to be said? How come it be Azar Hakadir in Israel from the other school of thought was also writing Tahanunim to be said? So obviously they didn't see Kara Ali Mu'ayd Mu'ayd yet. It's a set time now for Tisha'abi'ad. That's the only Mu'ayd that is. None Mu'ayd is in happiness. They didn't look at it as a day of happiness, they looked at it as a culmination of Asra bin Tibet and Shira Asra bin Tammuz. That's what they looked at. They looked at it as, you know, as the, as the peak of it all. Yes? How does uh, Harambam's version compare to... Uh, I'll give you Harambam's version. I'll read to you right now. Another question you want while I look for it? Should we go back to saying to Harambam? Saying Kinesan. You want to stay here? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, FCD doesn't answer this. Could you just review again how the changes made after the Crusades uh, eventually became standard throughout not only the Ashkenaz community but also throughout the entire Jewish Well, there's so many things that have happened where Ashkenazi practice moved from Germany through northern Spain, took over throughout most of Spain, and from there with the expulsion, that's it, it spread out very quickly. You have to understand, if you even look at the sources, it, at most sources of the early Aharim, 
they all, all tell you that we accepted in Spain all the rulings of the Rosh. Once they're telling you we accepted the rulings of the Rosh, the Rosh of Beo Asher, who said came from Germany and moved to Toledo, Spain, that's it. You know that Ashkenazi school of thought has taken over. My follow-up question would be, do we have any records of what the prayer was among Mustarabim before the arrival of the classical Sephardi in Spain? So, as far as Mustarabim are concerned, it's difficult to a certain degree. Some of it is definitely based upon the old Nosah Israel, and some of it even you can figure out the conjecture by looking at Mahzulah al Sova. More than that, I don't know. I don't have a set prayer to tell you this is exactly what was going on. But even among Mustarabim, we know there were differences between the Mustarabim of, let's say, of Safed in Israel and the Mustarabim of al Sova. There's definitely differences. I'm assuming the Tebanim all had a Harabam's prayer? The Harambam, yes, they definitely had Harambam's prayer. Okay. What's the oldest text? Sephardi or and what would it say? There are handwritten Sidurim from Spain. The earliest one that I'm aware of is 1391. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the earliest I'm familiar with. Do I have Haram uh, I have Haram Hmm? I don't have Haram Bam handy. Find it online for a second. Yeah, it's okay. No. But Haram Bam definitely had a very interesting uh, text of the, of the Rahim prayer. But that's basically it. So we're looking at a prayer that has evolved. And I think it's still evolving. As we know, Rabbi Haim David Hanavid made changes to it. Rabbi Shalom Moran made changes to it. Rabbi David Shalush made changes to it. Tom Wadiah has been massively opposed to any change to it. Uh, there's a Nafon Shilo now in Yerushalayim who, what do you call, where they try to work on reestablishing all the Nusha'ot of Israel. They've also created it. They went back to the Rahim prayer of the Yerushalmi with only minor changes to basically to reflect what's going on today with the political, political situation of Harabayat and how we have it in our hands, but we can't get up there. And we can't, if we can't get up there, we can't pray there. So all that's reflected in these different how Hopefully, we're going to go back to you know to a version that is going to say, for we want Rahamim, you know, in general, and we're already here and we're worshiping properly. That's it.